my name is Erin Hallinan, and I am thrilled to be asked to be part of the Do Influence. I think it is an important project that will help uh, guide the future of many people uh, moving forward, especially now in the setting of a national and global pandemic where everything we've known to be true is kind of um, up in the air. So I think that this is uh, an exciting and important thing to be part of. And so I'm actually going to stick to the questions for the video um, set forth by the by the Do Influence. So again, my name is Erin Hallinan. I am a critical care APRN intensivist in Connecticut. I currently work in two separate ICUs. And um, question number one says, what kind of professional are you and what is the type of training that that involve? So as a critical care nurse practitioner, uh, I am in the ICU uh, managing the patients completely and totally. And the training that is involved is winding pathway actually, uh, which is also a little bit of a cautionary tale for future nurse practitioners. And so far as I had started as a general surgery, vascular surgery floor nurse back in the day, uh, I went to Fairfield University, graduated in 1997, and uh, I got my first job at the Hospital St. Raphael in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And my whole intention of starting out in general surgery, vascular surgery, was to eventually move to the emergency department so that I could have a career as a nurse anesthetist. And when I got there, uh, I kind of progressed through the ranks pretty quickly. I became a level two charge nurse and a nurse educator within nine months out of school. And I was one of those people that didn't just need to know what I needed to do. I needed to know the hows and the whys of what I was doing. And I was fascinated by people and medicine and nursing and the physicians and how all the pieces fit together in a hospital. So from there, I went to the surgical intensive care unit. And then I realized very quickly that I had no idea what I had been doing out on the floor uh, for the previous couple of years. It's, it's interesting how you can be a quote unquote expert in one thing and then realize very, very quickly in a very humbling experience that you really didn't know much at all. So I spent the next several years learning all I could in the surgical uh, intensive care unit at St. Raphael's. And then ultimately I reached a point where I kind of plateaued and maxed out and really wasn't moving forward. I wasn't learning very much anymore. I was precepting, I was writing policy and procedure and started to do some freelance critical care education uh, and training out on the side. And from there, um, I kind of figured that my real love and my first passion is at the bedside. I really like taking care of people, which I think is super important if you're gonna go into nursing and into the, into the field of medicine. Um, so I decided to become a nurse practitioner. And back at the time when I was looking at schools, uh, my mentors and my guides all told me I should become a family nurse practitioner because I would be theoretically more marketable. And while that was true 15, 16 years ago, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And so I went to Sacred Heart University, I was the class valedictorian, and I graduated with my family nurse practitioner in 2007. Yeah, 2007, holy smokes. And uh, I don't lament that education at all. I do not regret it. I loved every minute of being in graduate school. I loved everything that I learned. Um, I think it's extremely important for me as a predominantly hospital-based critical care APRN to truly understand what happens out in the community and to understand the workflow out in the community between the primary care doctors, all the consultants, and what happens pre and post hospital. I was doing that for a while. I was working in an ICU and um, I was hired to start a critical care APRN PA run ICU at Yale. And I enjoyed every minute of that, um, but I always knew that I, I, I wanted more. I, I kind of needed more. I needed to be a little more independent. I didn't want to be the kind of nurse practitioner who succumbed to the title of mid-level, uh, which I find hideously insulting and I'll explain why later. Um, but someone who really stood on my own two feet, understood pathophysiology, understood pharmacology, and understood how all the pieces fit together uh, to, to really truly impact patient outcomes. And so uh, I did that for a while, and now I'm at another hospital down in the southern part of uh, Connecticut, where I am now uh, an APR and intensivist. The reason um, it's important that you understand how I got to where I was is because around 2015, 2016, uh, there was a law passed called the APRN consensus model uh, law. And even though the scope of practice 
varies state by state for nurse practitioners. There are some general rules and guidelines that of course are national. And the National Council for State Boards of Nursing, uh, and with the endorsement of a lot of credentialing bodies like AACN and AANP, AANA, ACNP, um, the ANA, ANCC, et cetera, uh, kind of got together and said that um, even though each state currently defines the scope of practice, the criteria for entry level practice and the exams for competence for APRNs, they really wanted to unify and make a framework wherein uh, a model would align all the criteria so that where you're working aligns with your education and aligns with your certification and your training. APRN regulatory model called the LACE model, ensuring a, a population-based focus of licensure, accreditation, certification, and education. And the consensus model uh, defines APRN practice, and the actual definition is it defines APRN practice, describes the APRN regulatory model, identifies the titles to be used, defines speciality, describes the emergence of new roles and population foci, and presents strategies for implementation. And the overall goal of all of this was to improve safety, improve access to patient care. And the reason why this is so important in such a part of my story is because I was a family nurse practitioner board certified, practicing in a critical care ICU, in a critical care capacity. And one might argue that I did not have the theoretical education and training behind my name to really be in that role. And while the state never came to me and said, you can't be here and you can't practice, and a lot of the states haven't gone so far as to do that, it's kind of hospital based at this juncture, what the underwriting of this law was that the insurance companies no longer have to insure you. So that was really scary. So I actually decided to go back to school and got a postmaster's acute care adult gerontology uh, acute care APRN certificate. So now I have both an FNP and an AGACNP. And therefore, I, I believe I'm theoretically covered um, in terms of my education and training. But that would be, you know, a word of wisdom to someone who's considering becoming a nurse practitioner in the future. You really need to understand what the laws are, where you live, and what your practice setting will be moving forward because you wanna make sure that you have the appropriate education, training, and certification in order to do so, in order to practice with a safety net and to know that you know, you're not putting yourself for medical legal liability. Typical day. So I get up in the morning like a jack-in-the-box at 5.30. Um, I kind of wake up on my own. I don't even need an alarm clock anymore. That's how you know you're getting older. And I make my coffee, I drive to the hospital, I think about my day, and I just kind of center myself as I drive in. Um, where I currently work, I like to get my patient assignment, I like to see who's on my list, and then I compute a round first. So I'll go through the computer and I will read all of the notes. So if I know the patient, I read from the last time I saw them forward, so I read all the notes so that I know what's happening to them currently. If it's a new patient and I've never met them before, I actually start at the H&P and read every single note forward. And some people may be like, oh, that's a little overkill, Erin, but I really need to know thoroughly and completely what path my patient has taken throughout their hospitalization and how we got to where we are today so that I can accurately anticipate what I need to do for them today and help move them forward in their plan of care to give them the outcomes that we hopefully want. So after I computer round, I go through, I collect all my labs, I collect all my data, I see who's febrile, who's not febrile, who was pan-cultured, last, what antibiotics everybody's on. I count my line device and access days. So I look, you know, do they have a central line? Are they intubated? How long has it been there? What date was it put in? Is that something I need to consider changing out? I look at their I's and O's and I really try to put a, a full complete picture together of what my patient is going to look like so that when I encounter them in the room, I really have all the information that, I'm, that, I, that I need. Those of you who have been practicing as nurse practitioners and PAs uh, for a while, know that there's nothing worse than walking into a patient's room and having the patient or the family ask you questions about their plan of care, their medication list, et cetera, and not having the answer. Um, it doesn't make us look competent. It doesn't make us look like we are uh, paying attention to details. And the one thing that we know to be true about critical care always is that the devil is always in the details. So I tend to be a very detail-oriented person. 
I also take that opportunity while I'm going through to replace my electrolytes, order fluid boluses if I think the patient is dry, um, start tube feedings if they're not on tube feedings, uh, look at their weaning parameters and see, you know, am, is this someone that I'm going to extubate today, check all their imaging, see if I understand and see what the reports are reading and if I agree and see if, if I have consensus for that. What made you decide to go into your field and did you always know what, is you, what you were meant to do? <laughs> No. <laughs> Short answer is no. Um, I did not know what I wanted to do when I was younger. I was looking at um, colleges and trying to figure out a career path, and I actually thought I wanted to be a Broadway set designer. Um, I am raised by an Irish Catholic military family, and a Broadway set designer was nowhere on the list of things that uh, would be a viable opportunity for me. So um, I was also not allowed or in theory to become a lawyer or any kind of ologist as my father um, was a Navy surgeon. So uh, my parents decided that if I was going to go to college and they were going to help me pay for it, then I should go into the field of nursing. So that being said, I did start working in hospitals at age 14. I was a volunteer OR aide. I was a candy striper. And I really did kind of fall in love with the environment and the pace of the environment and the fact that everything changes so quickly. Um, and so... Although I didn't know that that's what I was meant to do, my parents clearly identified that uh, passion in me early and helped push me toward that goal of, of going to nursing school. Which courses in college or high school did you find the most beneficial in preparing you for your career path? Um, obviously in nursing school, the three Ps, physical assessment, pharmacology, and pathophysiology um, are really probably the very most beneficial. I did uh, enjoy a lot of the community courses because uh, it put me out in the community to see a whole different other sides of nursing. But that being said, I was really quite specific in that I really enjoyed and loved the hospital atmosphere. I also knew that I probably wasn't gonna do very well in an office because I would get really, really antsy and just count the clock and look at the clock and count the hours and minutes until it was time to leave for the day. So I uh, probably wasn't gonna be able to give my best in an environment like that where I, I, I'm so easily distracted by, by time. Um, but really, you know, when I think back and look over my career, it's really just that I've loved the mystery of it all. I love the being a sleuth, putting together a patient's past medical history, figuring out where they've been, figuring out how they got to where we are today, and then putting them together in a way that makes them heal. So that's, you know, that's the other thing about critical care that I actually find very fascinating. Very little of what we actually do in critical care makes a true impact. Um, in terms of an immediate gratification. So sure, someone's blood pressure can be, you know, in the 70s, I'll hang some fluid boluses, put them on some pressors, and yes, their blood pressure comes up immediately, their lactate clears, they look better as the day goes on. But really all we do at the end of the day, when you take a step back and look at it with a ballpark view, is my job as an intensivist is to maximize all of the parameters and variables around the patient to allow their body to heal naturally as it's going to do so. Um, there's very few things that I actually truly do in the moment that actually fix an actual problem. Um, other courses that I found um, honestly truly the most beneficial, my favorite class of all time and my favorite rotation was uh, I did a summer of autopsies in pathology. And for someone who loves pathophysiology and pharmacology, uh, I have to tell you, really putting your hands on organs and seeing how strong the aorta truly is, how delicate bladder tissue really is, how soft a brain truly is, really helps solidify for me all of the, um, you know, things that could happen to patients. Nothing like holding someone's heart in your hand and literally looking at their LAD and their RCA and seeing scarred down white tissue devoid of contractile ability to really understand what an MI does to someone's heart. Um, so if you ever have the opportunity to do, do autopsies, uh, super fun, super exciting, and really, really just makes a whole lot of sense and really solidifies um, everything in terms of the human body and how it works and functions. What extracurricular activities did you participate in outside of regular coursework? Examples, clubs, internships, and conferences. Well, um, I was always one of those people that doesn't know how to say no. Um, the older I get, the more I'm learning that it's important to say no and to not overextend myself. Um, I was always members of all the clubs. I used to play field hockey. I used to play softball. I loved sports. I loved physical activity. Um, I had a third degree brown belt in Kempo and Jiu-Jitsu. 
uh, in terms of clubs. I was a member of Key Club in high school and chorus, and I was the yet editor of the yearbook. And then when I went to college, was in the jiu-jitsu, um, you know, extracurricular team, played some field hockey, and really uh, did focus on my nursing and my studying and, and, and trying to actually be present in college. In terms of conferences, um, you know, conferences for a nurse are just kind of synonymous with our field. Uh, when you become a nurse and when you become a nurse practitioner, you are truly embarking on lifelong learning. There is no point at which you will sit down and say, I'm done learning now. I know all I can about this profession because that's just simply unequivocally untrue. What college does for you and what graduate school does for you is it gives you the toolbox and the toolkit to set you up for the lifelong learning that you're gonna to have to do. There is not a single day, I can truly say this, there's not a single day on planet Earth that goes by where I don't look up something new, read something new, read an article, look at a news feed, or, 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 or check some sort of medical source to validate the information that I'm learning on a daily basis. And I think that if you just kind of understand that as you're going into nursing and nurse practitioning, that this is a lifelong learning process, things are constantly evolving and changing. And you know, that's actually one of the most interesting things too about the pandemic, and not to make this video all about the pandemic, but you know, everything that I knew to be true in critical care was literally dispelled and blown up in the span of an afternoon sometime in middle of March. Uh, patients who came in with this virus, this coronavirus, do not behave like typical patients with ARDS on a ventilator. The way that they behave, their hemodynamic instability, everything that we said and saw and thought and felt was all kind of dystopian to, to what we know to be true in critical care. Um, and so again, I find myself sitting here making this video for you, talking to you about the fact that you're going to be a lifelong learner when in fact I am again, learning everything from scratch and moving forward. How did you maintain focus to study and prepare for your exams and other coursework, other coursework in your professional school? Well, maintaining focus in college is difficult. Maintaining focus in graduate school when you're paying for it yourself out of pocket, much easier. So uh, the way that I focus and I study is I'm one of those people that really um, needed to figure out what my learning style was. And so I have always kind of ascribed to Albert Banderas's theory of social learning or a theory of experiential learning, depending on how you look at it. And there's a lot of roots uh, in his learning theory in psychology and social uh, behavior, but it's kind of the see one, do one, teach one mentality. Um, I'm a very tactile person. I have to see it, feel it, experience it, hear it, smell it, look at it to really understand how things work. Um, the other pieces of Albert's um, social learning theory are really, um, you know, paying attention to the information, uh, retaining the information, repro uh, reproduction of information and motivation. And so my motivation has always been very clear and it's always been very, very simple. My personal philosophy has always been that people who are entrusted in my care in the critical care environment, not one of them has ever woken up on a Tuesday and been like, gee, hope I can be on life support by six o'clock tonight and fighting for my life. Um, no one truly signs up for or asks to be there. And so if, as long as I remember that and remember that every person entrusted to my care is someone's brother, mother, uncle, father, sister, someone's relationship, um, I will give them my best and I will do my best to make sure that they have the outcome that they want. And part of that is understanding how I learn and making sure that I learn things thoroughly and completely um, to the best of my ability. The other silly thing I used to do to prepare for my exams, uh, Laura Gasparis is a very famous nurse uh, known in the nurse education realm. And she used to have this philosophy that if you ate a very salty breakfast, um, you would retain more information. And if you wore sunshine yellow or red, uh, it helps make your synapses fire faster. I don't know if there's any root uh, in reality to these things, but I always had a very specific shirt that I would wear to take tests in. It's red. It's the only piece of red clothing I own because I can't stand the color red. Um, so I would eat a bacon, egg, and cheese with french fries in the morning before major exams, including my board exams. And then I always had this paranoid fear that like I would have a flat tire or get into an accident and I would miss like a big exam or a board certification. So I was always there an hour and a half early. Uh, 
always, always, always in our professional world, better to be a few minutes early or even an hour and a half early than to be one minute late. Uh, so I always prepare for the unexpected. Other things about myself, I am a mother. Uh, I have an amazing 13 year old boy. He is a state wrestling champion. I never thought I would grow up to be a wrestling mom, but here I am. It's a fascinating sport. It takes a lot of guts to go out there on that mat and uh, kind of leave it all out there. So I really admire him for that. Other things, uh, I've been married for quite some time. I have an amazing husband. He's my best friend. He is my partner in life. And, uh, you know, you I kind of worried at the beginning of the pandemic with the social isolation if to, you know, would this go well? Would it not? But uh, it, we get along really well and he's been my number one supporter. He has supported me through my baccalaureate program. He supported me through my first master's and he supported me when I'm back to school for my postmaster certificate. And I still kick around the idea of going for a DNP. I don't know if he's into that so much. Um, but the other thing that like I've learned mostly about myself, especially as I get older and the longer I do this, is that you absolutely have to make yourself, your health, your mental well-being, your physical well-being, uh, and work-life balance a priority. Uh, I got to where I am because I sacrificed pretty much everything else to get there. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't do it again. I probably absolutely would because my path was my path and I don't regret any part of my path. But I do wish that I had more work-life balance and took time to relax and have fun and go to concerts and do things with people. Because at the end of the day, all we really have, your, your career isn't going to keep you warm at night. It's the personal relationships that you have with your friends, your family, and your loved ones that are really going to um, validate your life and your existence. And don't get me wrong, like I know I make a very good impact daily. Uh, in the in the ICU, I know I do a good job. I know I give my patients my very best. Um, sometimes I've gotten too attached and I've been devastated, devastated when bad things happen to the patient and they don't survive. Um, so it, it's a fine balance, but, but you really have to take very good care of yourself and um, have work-life balance because without it, you can't be your best in, in any place. You can't be your best at home. You can't be your best at work. So it's very, very important. Other personal interests that I'm pursuing, I'm currently writing a book chapter with a colleague on uh, preventing secondary complications in the ICU. Um, I've always been heavily involved in club work, um, uh, professional organization work. I, I love AACN, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. I think they're very important. I think ANP is very important to belong to if you're a nurse practitioner. Uh, I, these are my go-to places and sources for information. I belong to the Society of Critical Care Medicine. I think that's also a very important society to belong to um, because they also provide the education, the training, the support. And it's also nice to know that you're not alone and that you have people to bounce ideas off of and to validate uh, your clinical experiences with. Um, I've done a lot of speaking for AACN uh, regionally. Uh, at the Horizons conferences and some some local dinners and chapter dinners. And I think it's important to, you know, really kind of put yourself out there professionally uh, and to give back to our profession. Uh, so often, you know, we kind of just get lost in our own heads and the things that we're doing and trying to get to where we need to go. But it's very, very, very important to really kind of be the mentor that you wish that you had uh, to mentor and guide the next generation in because we're only as good as a profession as our weakest link. And if our weakest link is struggling, then I think that we have to extend a helping hand and help that person out and help get them to a place where they're comfortable um, and, and so that they can take good care of patients. Because at the end of the day, like we don't work in a factory, we don't make widgets. We There's a human being at the end of every single thing that we do every day. So I think it's important to um, answer that. And just another, you know, I, I had alluded to earlier that I don't like the term mid-level. Um, if you allow someone to address you in a diminutive tone or intent, then that's what you're going to ultimately believe about yourself. So I think that, you know, the term advanced practice provider is probably more appropriate for nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, we all have meaningful, positive contributions that we bring to this profession. 
And you would never walk into a patient's room with a doctor and be like, hello, here's your high level provider. I'm your mid level provider. And here's your nurse, your low level provider. You would never, it would never even occur to any one of us to diminish a colleague in such a way. And so I think that it just has a general negative connotation to it. So I really prefer the term advanced practice provider. And I also think that professionally speaking, um, nurses who are going to become nurse practitioners need to understand that, you know, you're on a lifelong journey, you're going to be learning forever. Um, you're only as good as your knowledge base. So you have a responsibility to make sure that your knowledge base is, is as thorough and extensive as it can possibly be to take care of patients in the way that they deserve to be taken care of. And you know, there's this whole dichotomy sometimes between physicians and APRNs. And I honestly believe in my heart of hearts, there is room for all of us at the table. Nurse practitioners, PAs, we tend to be very, very uh, detail oriented. And, you know, our physician colleagues don't always have the time to be that detail oriented, especially in an ICU. Uh, so it's, I, I, but they also have a, an amazing breadth of knowledge and wisdom and education and training and experience behind them. So when you put those two things together, then really the only person at the end of the day who benefits is the patient. And I think that that's how it should be. I don't know that there are any other key points that I want um, you to take away from this video other than to truly know what your passion is. And if you don't know, like that's okay. It's completely okay. That's the beauty of nursing and nurse practitioning. However, when you're going to become a nurse practitioner, and I have lots of colleagues who are doing this, you know, they go and they get their one degree and then they figure out, mm, I really prefer the hospital or I really prefer, you know, being out in the community and have had to go back for postmaster certificates. Just be open to that concept. Just be open to the fact that you might need to, to switch gears and seek a little more education and training. Um, and other things that I, I think that you should know are that you just need to put your best foot forward every day. Be professional, be on time, try to be the person that everyone is happy to see when you walk in the room because they know that you're going to take care of the patient and do a good job. Um, and more, I think the absolute most important thing is to have fun because at the end of the day, I can honestly say I love my job. I love my profession. I love taking care of people. I love taking care of my patients. I love figuring it out. Not a huge fan of the note writing that we have to do, but that's just a necessary evil uh, for reimbursement, et cetera. Um, but if you're passionate about what you do and you love it, it will show in the work that you provide. Uh, good luck. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if anyone needs a, you know, any guidance or has any questions about becoming a nurse practitioner. Uh, about any of the practice settings that nurse practitioners can practice in, um, how to get involved in AANP or AACN or SCCM or any of the other uh, clubs and organizations and governing bodies out there. And uh, I wish you well. Thank you.